I tell people, the standard tells you this is what kids have to do. But the trajectory tells you what are different pathways that they can take to get there. The standard doesn't tell you that. It doesn't, the standard says by the end of kindergarten, kids have to decompose and compose and decompose numbers within 10. But the learning trajectory tells you there are five levels of composing and decomposing numbers. And what I think is fascinating about this is like, Well, do we have a treat for you today? We're speaking with the great and obviously passionate Dr. Nikki Newton. By the end of this episode, you'll wish Nikki could just keep on going. She shares with us today her passion about learning trajectories and why we all need to learn them for various mathematical ideas. She fills us in on why we should be using running records and she gives you many knowledge bombs as well as resources during this one hour episode. Let's get to it. Hit it. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from tapintoteenminds.com. And I'm John Orr from MrOrr-IsAGeek.com. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark engagement, fuel learning, and ignite teacher action. John, we are ready for episode number 62 with Nikki Newton. Are you ready to get this thing going? Of course, Kyle. Of course. We are super pumped to bring you this episode for sure. Awesome. Well, before we get in there and start talking with Nikki, we want to thank you for listening to us wherever you are, in the car, at the gym, in the kitchen, washing dishes, or maybe on your prep time. If you've listened to us before and enjoyed the episodes and got some value out of it, we would love to hear about it. We read all of the reviews from this podcast from all over the world. And right now we want to share one of those reviews with you. This one is from Tiger A, which I don't know, is that maybe a Canadian Tiger 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 A? A Yeah, Tiger E-H. Yeah, Tiger A. What does Tiger A say there, John? Tiger A says, love having a dedicated math podcast. I am so happy that I stumbled across this podcast. It is the best math PD I have experienced. I appreciate the vulnerability of the guests and wide variety of strategies discussed. Awesome stuff. So again, a Canadian salute to Tiger A on Apple (laughs) Podcasts. Where are you listening from? Are you listening from the United States? Are you one of our wonderful math moment makers from Australia or New Zealand? We've got a lot of listeners there. Or are you listening from a country that isn't listening or isn't well represented on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast yet. If so, we encourage you to go leave a rating and a review, and we will be more than happy to share it on an upcoming episode. Our podcast here is Big Why is providing teachers across the globe high quality professional development on your schedule. We often talk about our three-part framework on how to create resilient problem solvers. And a must for us when developing lessons using the framework is having our students discuss, reason, defend mathematical ideas. A few routines that we use regularly in our classroom help us start these things called math fights. No, they're not a real fight. They're a math fight. It's a little better. Get your students actively estimating, questioning, discussing, and defending their insights, not with the teacher, but with each other. We've put together a one-page resource for you that shows you how to encourage discourse and discussion in your classroom while giving you the resources to make it happen. Be prepared to have your students argue about math. Head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash math fight. If you haven't checked out the math fight resources, you definitely have to. So go ahead, go grab that cheat sheet, makemathmoments.com forward slash math fight. And now let's get into our chat with Dr. Nikki. 
Hey there, Nikki. Good morning and welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are super excited to have you on the show today. Now that all of our technical glitches are behind (laughs) us, we spent a good chunk (laughs) of time together. You know, I can tell you're resilient. You can tell John and I are resilient. We did not let the technology take us down. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. It was a pleasure to see you at the CAMP conference, the uh, Conference for Advancement of Mathematics Teaching in San Antonio, Texas this summer. Nikki, could you help our listeners understand a little bit about yourself, where you're coming from, and how did you get into education? Well, I've been teaching for 30 years, 31 years, something like that. I um, started out as a bilingual teacher in California, bilingual Spanish. And I actually started out because I wanted to travel and sub. And then I was a Spanish speaker and they were like, oh, we've got something for you to do. Do you want to hang around a little longer than a month? (laughs) (laughs) So I started, I got into an emergency teaching program and I became a bilingual teacher. Then I taught for 10 years and then I decided I wanted to get my doctorate. So I packed up my bags, moved to New York City and went to Teachers College at Columbia, and I was a literacy social studies person. Then one day, an Australian company came to town, and they were hiring literacy consultants. And so my friends were like, oh, go get a job. So I went down there, and then that day, they were like, all literacy is closed, we're only doing math. And I was like, I hate math. I don't want to do math. I can't believe this. And then they were like, that's all we have. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll do it for like a year, and then I'm out. And then the rest is history. I fell in love with math. All my friends say I've come to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so fantastic. You're actually, your story, we had uh, Andrew Stadell on a little while back and there was some similarities there and, you know, he was supply teaching and he was playing in a band and you wanted to do some traveling. You kind of get in there and then all of a sudden you're falling in love with math, which I think is exactly What keeps us there, right, is trying to help make sure that students are falling in love with math as well. I'm wondering, Nikki, at first, it sounded like it wasn't like your dream job in your (laughs) mind. I'm wondering, maybe you could share a little bit of your experience from math class. We always ask people about memorable math moments from their own mathematical experience. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're not. But I think it's really important that we hear about them so that we can all learn and grow from them. So do you mind sharing one with us? You know, for me, my dad was an engineer. So my dad loved math. He could do math and he taught me how to do math. So I could always do math, but I didn't understand what I was doing. I just knew how to get the answer. So math was always very frustrating for me growing up. I did not like it. I could do it. My dad could help me every night with the homework. So I didn't like math. I loved literacy and history. And then when I was going to be a math person, I was like, well, I guess I better learn like some math, not just how to do it, but like how to explain it and how to teach people how to do it. And so that's how I fell in love with it, like actually learning how to do it and what it means and how you get the answer and how you help kids to learn it. Then how you help teachers to learn it, because really in the elementary school, a lot of teachers are uncomfortable with math. So I fell in love with learning how to do it when I learned how to do it in ways that made sense. Nikki, your experience is very interesting to me because I was a high school math teacher and I had the experience of always being quick to the procedures and understanding the math very well. Or actually, I shouldn't say very well because I was the big memorizer and the rule follower. And I think that had an effect on me as a teacher because I went into teaching math, not like you, like you went in thinking about like, I have to learn this well and understand it. Whereas I thought I understood math because I would grasp concepts by those procedures in high school very easily. But I think that hurt me as a math teacher early in my career because I was like, I know the way to do this, but I didn't. And I think you had this nice perspective of coming it from the other end, which is what most teachers, especially in the elementary field, are coming in. They're either scared of math or weren't sure exactly how all this math fit together. And I think you've got a unique perspective and advantage in your career for sure. Yes, I totally agree with that. I came in like, all right, how do you actually get people to understand this? How does it make sense? What are the models? One of my really good friends, Christine King, she was a middle school teacher. And I would say, okay, I know how to do this, but I don't understand how you model it in a bunch of different ways. And so she would teach me. And so I think mentors are invaluable. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, I was just going to ask you that. So it sounded like 
right away as John was talking and just reflecting on your experience, I was just thinking to myself, okay, so I bet there's a bunch of people who are listening to this who are either new to teaching or maybe new to teaching math, or maybe they're like John and I, who it took us a long time to realize what we didn't really understand. Like, where might they start? Is going to a mentor and trying to go to someone with a little more expertise in a building, is that somewhere where you think might be a good place to start? I think as elementary teachers, we have to do a lot more of, and I do this a lot as a consultant, we need to do a lot more content PD just in general and say, let's learn a lot about this thing and to really give people the opportunity to stretch their own pedagogy and to say, I'm not so comfortable with this. I'm in a PDs a lot where the kindergarten teachers are like, oh no, you're in third grade math. We're out. (laughs) (laughs) In reality, it's like, you've got to understand where kids are coming from and where they're going. Like John and I talk about this all the time in our online workshop about, you know, like, how am I going to be an effective kindergarten teacher if I don't understand how they learn early on? or where they're going, you know, like these are really important details there. And we've talked about this as well. I tip my caps to all elementary teachers because you need to know a lot about a lot of different things that aren't connected, like history and math or literacy and math even. You know, you need to learn a lot of things and that's a lot of hard work. So I really appreciate you saying that. It is. And well, you know, more and more schools are going towards departmentalization so that you have people at elementary schools who want to teach math, teaching it, which is really a good thing because there are some people that just don't want to teach it. But we should all be new. Whether we're teaching math or not, whether we're in a departmentalized school or not, we all have to get much more comfortable with math. And I think that has become part of my mission in life. And, you know, my tagline is always happy mathing because I want people Hmm. to like math. I want people to think like, even if I'm in a departmentalized school, I need to know some math. Like math is fun. Like it's a fun thing to do. We wrote a book recently. I wrote a book with a school district called Mathematizing Your School. And what I loved about the book is I went into their school and they were doing all this fun stuff. And I was like, I want to write a book with you. I don't want to write a book about what you're doing. I want to write a book with you. So it was like nine teachers and they all wrote chapters and they have mathematized their district. It's Pasadena School District in the Houston area. When you walk in their school, they have mathematicians row that has like boggle and tic-tac-toe and what doesn't belong all down the hall in big forms. They are living and breathing and loving math. Their goal in their district is that people love math. Right. And so they are like trying to shift the discourse. And I see that as something that I want to do. I want people to love the math. I want people to think math is fun. Right. I want people like and there's a book written by Charles Worth. And she says in the book, the little boy goes, how was it? And the other little boy goes, it was hard fun. And I love that. <laughs> hard <line>. fun. Yeah. <laughs> I want kids to be having hard fun, right? Enjoying right. it. And so I love the math, you know, so here it is. I remember how long I've been teaching now, 31 years, because I did literacy for 15. And then now I'm on my 16th year of teaching math. So now I've taught math longer than I've taught literacy. But I brought a lot of my structures when I switched. So the first book I wrote was Guided Math, because I knew a lot about guided reading. I was at Columbia where Lucy Calkins is. So I wrote a book on guided math. Then I wrote a book on math workshop. Then I wrote a book on math workstations because I knew a lot, not that they're the same, but I knew a lot of the structures. And so I'm really interested in that kind of like my degree actually is in curriculum design and teacher ed. And so I believe there's a lot of different ways to teach math. There's no one right way. I don't think it's a dichotomy. It's either or. I think it's always both and. I think there's so many strategies. And I think we as teachers, we need a knowledge base that is expansive, just like in literacy. In literacy, everybody knows the research. Schools do whole book studies all the time on the research. In math, not so much. And I want us to know a lot about math research because there's so much good research out there, but the way researchers write it, nobody wants to read it. 
Exactly. You need that sort of the middle people, right? And, you know, I would consider you being one of those great people who takes that research and you bundle it into a nice present for someone to dive into. And, you know, I just want to go back and talk a little bit about content specializing or departmentalizing. And I'm really happy that you had mentioned, first off, that that's a good thing, I think, if teachers are able to gain expertise in an area, but we can't shut the door on those other subject areas. You know, like we are together trying to help students learn all of these different areas, all of these different subject areas. So we don't want only a handful of teachers becoming experts in an area. However, I also think it's really, really tough for a teacher to do a really good job teaching all kinds of different subject areas, right? Absolutely. I think there's that balance there, just like you're saying, it's not a one or the other, but you know, finding that happy medium, I think is really important. Yes. And I think I'm really interested in it because I want to, I've started kind of a research project where I'm going around interviewing people about it because I see a lot of people moving towards it. I am on the road probably around 200 days a year and I go to probably at least 40 states a year. And then I do work in Canada, actually. And in the United Canada. States, I do. I do a lot of work in Alberta. I've done other parts of Canada as well, but I do a lot. I go to Canada at least probably twice a year for a week at a time. This is what I see in the States, especially. I see everybody's doing it. Some people are doing it from kindergarten. Some people are doing it only in the testing grades. And so I am right now getting ready to start doing a bunch of research on what works about departmentalization, what doesn't work about departmentalization, because I want to do it like a voices from the field. What do you think, what advice would you give somebody that's trying to do it? And I don't want to just do it from research papers. So I'm actually out there interviewing school districts that are doing it. And you get all kinds of really interesting answers. Some schools, it totally works because the scores were really low and people didn't understand the math and they didn't want to teach it. And now you've got people that absolutely love it doing it. The kids love it. And then everybody's teaching at their genius. But then you have other schools where it's not working. So, I mean, we got to figure out like what's working and what's not and how do we fix it? And I think, like I said earlier, regardless of whether you departmentalize or not, everybody at your school should have basic numeracy. As teachers, we should all want to have basic numeracy, right? I mean, I don't understand like why anybody would not want to have a basic level of numeracy. It goes to show, like you just mentioned that in a departmentalized school, you'd want those teachers to show their passion if they're passionate about that subject and it shines through to the kids. It's sometimes hard to think about a teacher who's not passionate about math and then now has to teach math. And it makes me think about that school that you were talking about. It's like their mission was to everyone was going to enjoy math. Like, I think it's so important, whether you're departmentalized or not, that everybody, like you just said, has to have some foundation and also like get that out of their mindset that math is the punishment or math is like this subject that like, I don't want to do it. I'll let you do it. Right. If that's why you're departmentalizing, then something else has to change about the school. Like, we can't just say like you do it because you like it. We all have to have that, say, mentality. Maybe that's why those schools aren't working, right? It's like that person's doing it and I'm the naysayer over in the other grade. And so the other thing to think about is sometimes like teachers are moving grades or schools and there's a lot of fluctuation based on school numbers. I'm interested to hear your thoughts about that. You were studying like what is working, what's not. Do you have any ideas on that? You know, there is a school of thought that just in general, when you have adults working in their genius, that you have a lot more productivity, right? So the idea of, I think if we celebrated math in general in schools, just as a school, if you're celebrating math and then you have people that are working in their genius, if you just love math and science and you want to teach the math and science section and do things that nobody else would ever want to do with <laughs> Hmm. Go for it. Hmm. I think there's some really powerful stuff to be said for that model. And then other people are teaching literacy and social studies. But I've also seen it fail miserably. And there's also the developmental argument. It's like some people say, well, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, you really shouldn't do that because of these reasons. But then other people are like, oh, no, we do it from kindergarten up and we're having all kinds of success. So that's why I'm so interested in it, because it just depends who you ask. Right. And there's not a lot of research on it. There's some, but not a lot. So I am in the middle of gathering what research we have on it and then out there interviewing schools in different states about how is it working? Right. Looking at models of success, because I think that's really what we have to do. 
at camp, I was talking about equity. And one of the things that they talk when they talk about equity is that they say, Gutierrez says this, she says, we spend so much time gazing at the gap that we don't do anything. And he, right. we can't just it's gaze. It's paralyzing. At, yeah, we can't just gaze at the gap. Do something. Look at what can be done. Look at places that are closing the gap. Because we do have people that are closing the gap. We have people that are succeeding. Let's look at those models and figure out what they're doing well and do that, right? right. So right. I am right. really for that. Like looking at where, who's teaching kids math in ways that is succeeding? And then how do we model that? How do we take some of that good stuff, right? Instead of just talking about how everything sucks and it's not good. <laughs> what What is right. good? There is good somewhere. Somebody's doing good right now in this moment. I want to find that person and ask yeah. them, how do I replicate this or how does this inform what I'm doing here in my location, right? With the kids that I work with. I think some of that gap gazing that you reference, like I, I think that's so true. It's a great expression, but I guess for the wrong reason, right? Because like we don't want to be gap gazing. We want to actually do something about it. And then for districts, it's like sometimes they just get paralyzed from like how hard it is to change structural items, right? Or structural things, the way we've always done things. You know, if I do this, then how's that going to change staffing? How's it going to do this? But at the end of the day, it's like we do it all for the kids anyway. So it is so worth it. And then you had mentioned about the genius zone. And I think that right there is genius because we want teachers in that genius zone. But I almost worry that some might interpret that that may be differently than you or I are thinking about Genius Zone, because again, you could have that teacher that has learned procedurally their entire life and they were told they were good at it. And then they're going to perpetuate that speed yeah. and memorization yeah. oh, and, and you know, the please. lack of conceptual understanding, right? My friend Annalise, she always says that speed and accuracy have hijacked fluency. <laughs> I love that yeah. because it's true. You are so right. <laughs> and you know, Annalise is actually a part of our Make Math Moments Academy. We have some great discussions in there, and she's a phenomenal, phenomenal math speaker, as well as just has that expertise under her belt. So that's fantastic. I love that expression. I want to go a little deeper here because I think all three of us have agreed that understanding the content is so important. Like what I've been promoting in my district and districts I visit is this idea of I don't need a teacher to come out of their pre-service being a subject specialist. But what I do want is to give them the opportunity to gain expertise because they have more than one opportunity a day to teach mathematics. So I think at the core of that is content. And something I heard at your camp session that I really liked, and you really focused in on the idea of counting and quantity. And at one point you had said, how many different stages? I think you referenced them as stages. How many different stages of counting are there? And I made a very intentional move to look around the room to see, not only listening at my table about what people were saying, but to listen around the room. Because when I present about counting and quantity, we get all kinds of different ideas. Some are like, what are you talking about? It's just one, two, three, four, <laughs> like I'm there. Other people are saying, well, I, they're including all kinds of things that aren't even necessarily connected to the early counting. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, why are you so passionate about counting and why teachers have to understand the progression through how students learn counting? You know, I love this question. I love the learning trajectories. I don't know if it's possible to be in love with like a learning trajectory, but I am. Oh, it <laughs> is. It <laughs> is. Yeah. What I love learning trajectories is this. Remember, I have a literacy background. So what I know about literacy is that when teachers sit down to talk about where kids are, they have the language to describe what kids are doing. What I know about math is we say, oh, well, they can count and they can't. <laughs> That's like the end of the conversation. So what a trajectory does is it gives us the descriptions of what kids are doing in different spaces. You know, the Clements and Sarama, I mean, everything, you can critique anything you want, right? And say, well, it's this or it's that. But what it does is it gives us 
a trajectory. And if you look at any of the NAEYC stuff, they're mentioned a million times. They're the grandfathers of it. Well, the grandfather and the grandmother of it. But the idea that it gives us a space to talk about what kids are doing. It's not to say that, oh my gosh, it's lockstep. You're going to do this. No, what it is, is it's a trajectory. It tells us these are all the things that kids can do when they're counting. Now, given the live child that you have in front of you, Right. What, what are they doing? Where are their strengths and where are their weaknesses? I think that everybody should know their trajectories. And you know why? Because the more we know, the better we can do for our kids. And so I love it. There's 20 levels. I taught for, I don't know, I just learned about the trajectories three or four years ago. So I'm like, how did I even teach without knowing? These things? Because now I can look at a child and I can say, you know what? They're doing really well here. And this is where they're struggling. I'm going to have to do some things to help them right here where they're struggling. Or when I'm trying to differentiate, they're good descriptions that help you when you're trying to differentiate for kids, right? It's not that you say, oh, he's a level one and he's going to be a level two. It's not that. It's a description that tells you where kids possibly could be because, you know, some kids are like, they're going, 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 and then they're at level eight, but no, they can do stuff on level 12 too, right? And what it does is it gives you a description that is a beautiful description of what the landscape looks like. And I think if teachers knew that more, just like strategies, it is amazing to me. In the States, the Common Core has been out for, not everybody did it, but most people did or did some version of it in their state. It's been out for 10 years. Do you know to this day, there are still teachers, and it's no fault of their own, but there are still, still teachers that are like, I don't know the names of the strategies. They don't know the names of the strat like doubles, doubles plus one, doubles plus two, make 10. Like if we're trying to teach kids, you need to know those. You know what I mean? And so I just wrote a book called Leveling Math Workstations. And a lot of people misinterpreted the title. I should have just called it Differentiating Math Workstations because I'm not talking about leveling like, oh, these are the bluebirds and these are the lizards. And I'm not talking about tracking kids. I'm talking about what are the descriptions? Where are kids along a trajectory? And how do we know how to move them, how to help them? How do we help kids? You know what I mean? And so that's why I love the trajectories, because they allow us to differentiate. They allow us to know what the trajectories are. I also, I'm really a big fan of concrete pictorial abstract and really looking at that cycle of engagement so that I know like, Oh, I'm going to teach these guys with the wreck and wreck and we're going to build it on the wreck and wreck and then we're going to draw it and then we're going to take it to the symbolic. But I also know that I'm not going to rush kids to symbolic because I need them to actually understand it conceptually. And most programs rush through concrete pictorial abstract. They rush through concrete and they're rushing to symbolic. Why? So you rush to symbolic and you get there and then kids have no understanding of what they're doing. So all they know is, oh, flip it and multiply. But they can't tell you a story about it because they don't understand what it is. And they can't even really tell you if their answer is right because they don't know for sure. They just know the procedure. So we've got to slow down in order to actually speed up. You need a knowledge base. Yeah, we've said that many times. We call it, you know, rushing to the algorithm, meaning being more high school-y, middle school-y for us. But we tend to, like you said, we skip all the concrete and go straight to the abstract. And it's a wonder why kids are like, what, where do these letters come from? And why all of a sudden are we doing these procedures when they didn't understand that, the concrete from before? One of the things also I wanted to say about learning trajectories and really understanding what those descriptions are is they allow us to pull guided math groups. And, you know, I'm a big believer in guided math, not as a way of tracking kids, because I definitely don't think you should do that, but as a way of a, pulling a focus group and working with kids in their zone of proximal development. I think that's really important. I think there's lots of strategies for teaching kids. And so I don't believe in either or. I believe in both and. But I believe there's room to pull kids in homogeneous groups and in heterogeneous groups, because I really believe that sometimes when you got a bunch of folks who can't count to five and then you got a bunch of other folks who can count to a thousand, that sometimes you pull those folks that can't count to five and you work on counting to five. <laughs> and other times you work in a heterogeneous group. I believe that there is room for homogeneous grouping, not as like you're going to be in this group all year long, but as a focused group of differentiation for a time, I believe after 31 years of teaching a lot of kids in a lot of places that if you pull kids in small guided math groups, teach them in their zone of proximal development, you can help them to get to where they need to go. 
I think especially about that, teachers get bogged down and be like, oh, we should not do homogeneous groups, so we'll never do them. And like you said before, like the more you know, the better teacher you can be and the more strategies you know, the better teacher you can be. And I think we get that tunnel vision. It's like, oh, I can't do that because someone said something bad about it. All we want to do is help kids. And if that strategy is going to help that group of kids or in that time frame, then great. But yeah, like who wants to be in all of a sudden, like I'm in the Eagle group for the whole year. And it goes back. I remember what I want to say about the learning trajectories too. It's like, and I think you mentioned this too, but the biggest thing for me was seeing what a kid can produce or where they are on the trajectory allows you to be like where you can help push them to go next. And if you don't know that, right, like if you don't know that trajectory and you're just maybe relying on a textbook, you're just gonna be like, okay, we'll wait till tomorrow when I do the next lesson all together, which is the homogeneous group. Yes, you have totally named it. And that's what I love about the trajectory, because you then know exactly where kids are. And you can say in your teacher mind, this is what I need to do. Because, you know, this is what I tell people. The standard tells you this is what kids have to do. But the trajectory tells you what are different pathways that they can take to get there. The standard doesn't tell you that. It doesn't. The standard says by the end of kindergarten, kids have to decompose and compose and decompose numbers within 10. But the learning trajectory tells you there are five levels of composing and decomposing numbers. And what I think is fascinating about this is like, Level three is, okay, kids are going to compose and decompose within four and five. And then level four is that kids compose within seven. So seven is like one of the benchmarks that you compose up to seven. And then finally you compose up to 10. So although the standard is to compose and decompose to 10, we now know what the trajectory looks like. And so we can talk about where kids are, where they need to go next, where are they really strong, where are they struggling. The trajectory allows you to plan better. Right. And that's what my book on leveled math workstations actually does. It says, hey, here's some trajectories and then here's some activities that you can do along the way for these trajectories. It doesn't say you have to be here and do this and then go here and do. No, it says here's a whole variety of things that you can do with kids that are working at this stage of learning this thing. Some kind of way in math ed, it'd be really interesting to do. And people have done this, study teachers and ask them, what did you learn in your math ed class? Because the most Most of them did not learn how to teach math. (laughs) I know I didn't. It was, you know, about classroom management. And even that didn't work for me. You know, I came out and I felt like I didn't know anything. Right. And I mean, that's a lot of it's my lack of expertise. But I think something that just came out through the discussion, both in your comments and John's comments about whether homogeneous, heterogeneous groupings. And really, like you were saying before, it's not a dichotomy. It's not a one versus the other. It's like a when is it appropriate? And you're referencing, Nikki, specific math skills that we want students to be able to achieve over time. And you're targeting them through this trajectory. And I think where some of the heterogeneous groupings that we've used in the past, the reason why those weren't effective and why they were not so helpful for students' confidence and so on and so forth is because, like John said, you're stuck in that group all year. And the reason why was likely because I, as the teacher, didn't know how to help you in that group, get to the next place along your journey. It was just like, you were just there and I'm just going to give you stuff that you can do already. That's not helpful at all. That's that horizontal mathematizing. We're not helping you push up and I can't help push you up because the only thing I know is the next step is the standard, which you're nowhere near the standard. So I think that's super helpful. John and I talk about heterogeneous groupings and mixing students up. We're typically talking about when we're problem solving. We're not looking at a very specific skill. We have a learning goal in mind, absolutely. But then from that problem solving, that's where we can go, okay, wait a second. I've got three students over here that are at this place. And that's where those small groups can be so helpful, right? Going with heterogeneous grouping in a small group is not going to be very helpful because you're going to have kids that are at very different places. So I'm hoping people at home are listening to this and going, okay, so there's a time and a place depending on what we're trying to do here in our classroom. Absolutely. And I think that's just so important. I also think like, I love that you brought up problem solving. There's so many cool things now going on with problem solving. You're right. I mean, a lot of it has been in the literature forever, but people are actually saying this is what it looks like in the 21st century. Right. So 
I love it because I think like doing numberless word problems, doing three act tasks, doing three read protocols, all of that is so wonderful. And we need to have rich experiences, heterogeneous experiences with our kids. There's also the traditional routine problems, right? The 15 levels of single step, the five level of two step. I think that stuff's really important because schema based problem solving has been around forever. But we do know that it goes from simple to complex. So what I find is a lot of times teachers for independent practice, having kids work on really complex problems and they can't even solve the simple ones. So I think it's important that teachers know, hey, this goes on like a route of simple to complex problems. Where are my kids on this? Which ones can they solve really well and where are they struggling? They can really solve the change unknown, but they can't solve the compare at all. It's important that teachers know those things. It goes back to teacher knowledge. What do you know as a teacher? And then how can you use that to get everybody where they need to be by the end of the year? See, I think teacher knowledge is very tied into equity because you can't give your kids a fantastic experience if you don't have the knowledge base to do that. Right. Amen to that. That is so true. And we are loving that and trajectories. We've been talking about that for a good amount of time and we should be. But uh, say I'm at home right now, Nikki, listening and I'm thinking about trajectories and where should people go to learn more about this? Well, you know, everybody has critiques of whoever and they can. But I think some of the foundational trajectories that are referenced the most in NAEYC and in NCTM are the Clements and Sarama. And remember, they got a Bill and Melinda Gates grant. And so now they have a website called LTLT or LT Squared. And you just put in LT Squared, Clements and Sarama. And they have all of the trajectories up there with videos of the kids and all kinds of free resources. If you have children and they're at this level, here are some activities that you could do with kids at this level. I mean, it's a phenomenal site. It builds teacher knowledge, which is what we're always trying to do. So I would start there. And then there's NCTM just put out a really good book on learning trajectories. Oh, we'll look that up for the show notes for sure. So I'm going to make a note of that here as well, because I did not know that. And I just pasted in a link in our notes as well for the learningtrajectories.org. That'll take you over to that LT squared site in our district. In particular, one of our early years consultants, Angeline Humber, she is a huge fan of that. And I've been through there and it is super, super in depth. I love, like you said, you can read something and go, okay, so here's the trajectory. I'm not quite sure what this one means. Well, hey, just click this video here and you'll get to see what that looks like in action, which I think is so fantastic. And as you mentioned, it's supported by the Gates Foundation and you are good to go to get yourself an account and log in and it's all free and open to the public. So that is such a fantastic tool. I'm learning so much about it every single day. And I think for people listening, and I think Nikki, you'd probably agree, this is not something where you go, okay, like (laughs) starting today, I'm going to learn this and by tomorrow, Tomorrow, <laughs> I'm going to have this down. This is a process and you have to continue refining that process and refining your understanding. And you're going to change some of your understanding along the way. You're going to think you have something and you're like, oh no, it means this. And then over time, that's going to continue to shape into something a little bit different, a little bit more in depth. Think about teachers. We already talked about how some teachers are teaching multiple subject areas. Like some are teaching up to six, maybe even eight different subject areas in a week and over is something that is so easy to run into. John and I run into it all the time. And, you know, it's hard to take our own advice. So obviously we have a website to start at. What might be some tips for someone to just kind of start scratching the surface so that they don't get too overwhelmed and they either go on stress leave or they just shut the browser down? You know, I wrote a book recently just called Leveling Math Workstations, which is about learning trajectories and differentiation. The book is a really good place to start. The website's a really good place to start. But more importantly, this. I think people should start, if you're in the primary grade, start with the counting trajectory because it's amazing. It gives you the language to talk about where kids are. And then I would do composing and decomposing and subitizing because the subitizing trajectory is so important because what I see happening is I see teachers flashing those dots all year long, same dots all year long. 
But if you understood the learning trajectory of subitizing, you would understand this is about subitizing lays the foundation of arithmetic. There is so much place value in it. And there are 10 levels of subitizing. Kids should be subitizing all the way through like fifth grade where they're doing the quick images of the decimals. And where the kids are saying, oh, I saw five tenths in two hundreds. I saw 50 two hundreds. Or in first grade where they're doing the hundred grid. Remember Kathy Richardson made those tell me fast cards where you flash it really fast and then kids have to tell you the place value. They say like, oh, it's a hundred grid, but it's blank. And then say there's two unshaded. And they say, oh, the kids say there's 98 shaded because two are not shaded and two more would make a hundred. I mean, there's so much place value. But if you didn't know the trajectory, you wouldn't know that you leave the dots. You leave the land of the dots at some point, the (laughs) dot, the tin frame, the dice, and the domino, and you go on to the hundred grid, right? And then you start subitizing by groups. Graham Fletcher's done some really good work around subitizing by groups. That's a part of the learning trajectory that the kids start seeing 20, but they see it in groups. Oh, I saw four groups of five. Graham has a good video up of a little girl doing that. And then you go on, you know what I mean? Like there's a trajectory for subitizing. Teachers need to know that trajectory. So I would say counting and then composing, decomposing and subitizing as a place to start. But I also want to say, because I think it's really important understanding what are the phases or the levels of sophistication or whatever you want to call them, the continuum. You know, these are all the different things it's called in the research for teaching basic math facts. The teachers really need to understand, oh, there's doubles and you're probably going to learn make 10 before you learn doubles. Oh, although kids like love doubles, but you're going to learn how to bridge 10. You know what I mean? That there are there that you learn usually plus zero and plus one before you learn how to count within five. I mean, add subtract within five. So That idea of like, how do we scaffold access with math facts within 20? There's a really good book. I don't know what it's called. It came out by Bay Williams and Kling recently that has a bunch of games on the levels. And I just wrote a book with Annalise, actually, and Allison Mello, Dr. Allison Mello on fluency doesn't just happen. And it's coming out in about three or four months. And it's all just a bunch of games for different strategy levels. So I think that's really important. You know, that's where I do a lot of work in Canada on guided math, but also on running records, because I wrote a book on running records. And the book on running records is, again, it's about you give the kids a clinical interview because, you know, the thing is, this is the thing. And we don't do this nearly enough in math. You find out the darndest things when you ask kids questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you actually ask and listen. Right. Eh? Who knew? Yes. <laughs> you ask. A and it's so hilarious because I've done thousands of running records at this point. You know, running records aren't new. They've been around in the research for years. But the way they did them, they did them on a PowerPoint slide and they did like 96 slides and then the kids have to answer in three seconds or whatever. So anyway, I took the basis of a lot of the running records and then they would ask kids questions. I took a lot of that and made it into something we could do in schools. And people do it literally, I kid you not, I know of at least seven countries that are doing running records, including Mexico, Bahrain, Japan. I mean, people call me all the time and I Skype with them about doing running records. But I do a lot of work in Alberta running records as well. This idea that if you actually ask kids questions, you find out all kinds of amazing stuff. And some of the best times I've had with kids doing running records is I'll go to a school and they'll be like, Oh, Dr. Nikki, you know, this is a high kid, right? They'll say that. This is a high kid. They're going to know everything. And you sit down and you start asking the kid about numbers and they don't know it. Right. They know lots of answers, but they don't know what the heck is happening. Yes. And the teachers are like, oh, my gosh. And then somebody else will come in and they'll be like, oh, then he doesn't really know much. And he knows all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and they're like, what? It's amazing. He's like a C student and he's like blowing everybody away. He's just like doing a saying all kinds of stuff. I mean, just doing all this amazing stuff. I always tell people, you got to talk to him. You got to ask him questions. That's why I love the running record because it allows you to see the thinking behind the thinking. The running record has three parts. So the first part is just like quick kind of an overview. But the second part, you ask kids, what are you doing to get the answer? What do you do with those numbers? What's your strategy? And then traditionally, in math research, there's codes for what kids tell you to do. So that part is incorporated in the running records. So then when you're done, you have like a portrait of where kids are in terms of the different aspects of fluency. Yes, you understand if they're automatic or not, but that's not the important, you know, that's just some information we need, but you really get to see, are they flexible? Are they a 
efficient. You get to see, you know, are they strategic? Do they have accuracy? How do they think about numbers? And then another part of the running record, I ask kids, do you like math? And what do you do when you get stuck? And people say, oh, they're just going to tell you anything because you're the teacher. They're going to say nice things. No, they tell you the truth. The kids say, I hate math or I love math. I can't get enough of it. Or it's okay. You know what I mean? Because disposition is really important. It tells us what kids, how they're going to engage by their disposition. So I just think we have to do more of that in math class. We've got to ask kids questions. Speaking of mentors, at the beginning, we had started talking about mentors. There's a woman named Coco Aguirre, and she taught me how to teach, basically. And on the threshold of her door, when you walked in, it said, and I've never forgotten this, from the moment I met Coco at a summer workshop, a Madeline Hunter master teaching summer workshop, when I first started teaching. And on the threshold of her door, it said, if kids don't learn the way you teach, then teach the way they learn. I have never forgotten that. If kids don't learn the way you teach, then teach the way they learn. It's so interesting, too, because in some places in the world, the word teaching and learning is the same word. So if I'm teaching, but they're not learning, then I'm not teaching. <laughs> you know, you're just talking. So that is so powerful. I'm so happy. We were looking at the time worried that we wouldn't get to running records. So I'm so happy that we got a brief overview there of what running records are. We've been doing a lot in our district with different tools. One's called Prime and uh, another's Leaps and Bounds. Leaps and Bounds a little bit more kind of targeted. And really, it involves sitting down with kids and asking them questions. And it's crazy. Like you had said, the students that are like, oh, you know, this student tends to struggle. And some of the things they say, they're like, well, when you ask me this question, my teacher wants me to do it this way, but I think it should go this way. And then they show you something that's like completely fantastic the way they've approached this problem. And you learn so much about where they are and where you need to go next. And basically from that last little bit, we were talking about like, where do people start? And it sounds like to me, one of the big takeaways I have is we just have to get started. So starting with counting, like you had said, seems like a great place to start. I'll put a link to one of our, we have a principles of counting cheat sheet, but like you were saying, that's just the start. Like you look at that and it continues to grow. I continue to modify it as I continue to learn and grasp and understand how kids learn and develop. These are things that you're never going to get there, but it's just get on that journey as what I'm hearing. And I think your book would be another great place for people to start as well. So we'll be sure to link that up. You know, and I think that it's about the journey. It's about constantly being a learner. I love this profession that we're in because I'm constantly learning. You know, I research all the time. I read research. I love research. And then I love to see mm, that. I know what the article said, but that kid's not doing that. right? I love, I love to be in classrooms. I try to be in classrooms at least one or two weeks out of every month so that I can actually see what kids are doing, right? I know what the research says. I know what kids are doing. I want to put those two things together and see how we help and contribute to the field. How do we all get better? How do we learn more? I had a mentor. Heidi Hayes Jacobs was one of my mentors. And Heidi used to always say this. She would pull out an empty chair and she would tell whoever she's doing PD with. She still does it to this day. She says, we're going to have a conversation and it's about Maria. Maria would be the empty chair. She said, because everything that we're going to talk about in here is about Maria. Because you have teachers sometimes who don't want to get on the train and learn new stuff. But Heidi would say, we're not talking about what individual teachers want to do and don't want to do. We're talking about Maria. And any decision we make in here is, is it best for Maria? Does it help Maria? Maria learn what she needs to learn in her journey at this school. And I love that because when I'm working with teachers, you guys know, because you do a lot of PD, when I'm working with teachers, I always try to center the child and say, yes, we're going to learn about learning trajectories. Yes, we're going to learn about differentiating this or differentiating that. And you know why we're learning about it? Because the question always is, does this help us help Maria learn what she wants to learn. And you know, the new Hattie stuff, you know, Hattie's shifted to the, I think it's like eight dispositions or something. And remember, one of the things is he said, I'm not so concerned anymore about what teachers are teaching. I want to know what kids are learning. And that kind of mirrors something that one of you just said. I think John just said it. What Not what are we teaching, but what are kids learning? That's the question in the guided math group, whether it's heterogeneous or homogeneous, in the whole group, in the mini, what did they learn? Not what did you teach, but what did they learn? Because sometimes those are different things, even though they shouldn't be. 
And I think that goes to also like putting a face on your day, you know, like you're talking in generalities, but you have to put a face on it so that everyone can imagine their kids in their room. You know, it's almost like uh, I get this image of, you know, like everyone critiques doctors for not like being, you know, when you go into a hospital, you're like a number, but then you get that one doctor who treats you like a human being and you're like, oh, thank goodness. And it's like, we got to think about that too. As teachers, sometimes during PD sessions, we're not doing that. And if saying we have an art district is similar to that kind of mantra. It's like, why this learning for this student at this time? And that's kind of like our guide in our district right now. Like, why are we doing this for that kid at this time? So that's been our mantra. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'm sure that we could talk all day about stuff, but we know you're busy. So right before we say our goodbyes, we want to know what current projects are you working on just before we wrap up here? Well, I am working on a couple of things. I am working on a big book of pre-K K and first grade math, kind of hands-on math activities. Again, kind of trying to build teacher knowledge around the learning trajectories. I also am working on a book called Equity, Getting the Conversation Started, really looking at what can we do in schools every day? What do we have the power to change? And then why are, like, I just want to say this one thing. This is one example of it. This is what we know. We know that we have a lot of kids in a lot of our schools that are impoverished. We know that kids that come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, not all of them, but some of them, most of them actually are a couple of years behind in math. We know that kindergarten is a foundational grade. We know that if you do intervention in kindergarten, that you can change the trajectory of a child's mathematical and reading career. But nobody does intervention in math in kindergarten. Very few states. Why? If we know all that stuff, why? Why are we not doing intervention in kindergarten? It's a question of equity. That's just one example, but I'm really passionate about this idea of not gazing at the gap, but what are things that we can change? Because we can change that. We can say we're going to do intervention in kindergarten because we understand it's one of the most important grades. We are not going to do pull-out programs for our bilingual kids in math class because we understand that there is no matrix out there. We are the matrix. We control the schedule. <laughs> we can say we're not going to pull the kids out during <laughs> math class. You know what I mean? So I want to write a book about equity. Get it. I'm in the middle of writing that book. Actually, on my podcast, that's the new series is equity, getting the conversation started. I think we have to do that. And then the last thing is I write a couple of books at a time. I'm writing a book called The Eight Habits of a Productive Disposition because mathematical disposition, from the research, there are eight elements. Nobody ever talks about them. The only one we talk about is mindset. Do you know that growth mindset is one of eight elements? Do you know what some of the other elements are? I'm just going to tell you. Curiosity is one of the elements. Creativity and curiosity. We don't ever talk about that in math class. Imagine if we yeah, did. And those are like central discussions for John and I. And I'm so happy that you're bringing that up to the forefront. And I'm super excited to hear what you come up with when you finish that book off. Yes, I think we have to talk about something. And you know who really inspired me was when I was in Alberta. And I say Alberta, I know it's a state, but I go, usually when I go, I go to five stops in the state. And so like I take basically almost a train, a plane, and an automobile on that trip. And maybe horseback. <laughs> yes. And, and what I see in the classrooms is part of the Alberta standards is curiosity in math. In some of the classrooms, they have these tables and I'm like, what's happening here? And they're like, oh, we want kids to be curious. And so it's like, what do they see? And what do they want? I mean, I am like, I love the fact that curiosity is part of the Alberta math standards. You know what I mean? That's important. Yeah. If kids don't have that productive disposition, if we don't have their attention, right? And we're not just talking about engagement as that buzzword. It just gets thrown around. But if we don't have kids leaning in, excited to learn, what are we doing? What are we even trying to accomplish here, right? Like we've got to get them leaning in. We've got to get them thinking positively about mathematics, feeling like there's a reason we're doing it, not just because of my job I'm going to have later. Or I want to make money or, you know, we as adults think those things are important, but most kids don't. They want to learn and they're naturally curious. And I think it's because we usually stomp out curiosity. We stomp out creativity and we get them all single file and all of these things. And I'm so happy to hear that you're bringing that to the forefront. So that's fantastic. 
Listen, Nikki, we do not want to hold you up. But John here, we're talking in a Google Doc and he's saying, I think we're going to have to do another episode here. So (laughs) hopefully you'll be open to that maybe in another uh, six to eight months. Maybe we could bring you back in, talk about your progress on these new projects and continue and dive deeper into some of these discussions. What do you say to that? No, that's I would be honored to come back and talk about it. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. We want to thank you, Nikki. And uh, maybe one more thing is where can all of our listeners go to learn more about you and also your podcast? If they go to drnickynewton.com, we're in the middle of building it out even more, but they'll see a lot of links on there because I have a podcast. I have a math academy as well that has about 20 courses, some which they can take for credit. There's like a guided math course and a running records course and stuff that they can take university credits for. And then what's important also is that the in my books, the Black Line Masters, you can pull them off the website. And then I can also send you guys some links because I have the link for the equity talk that I did at camp. I have that link and it's a Padlet that has tons of resources. I also have a link for running records. You know what I mean? Maybe I can send you guys a couple of links. Perfect. Yeah. If you send them to us, we will put them in the show notes and everyone listening right now will be able to just click them. You guys, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to do this. This has been really fun and I just appreciate you having me on and I'm very honored to have been invited. Thank you so much. All the pleasure is ours. Yes, Nikki, it was an honor and hopefully it won't be too long before we bump into you at another uh, conference sometime soon. Okay. I'll be in Alberta in October. In October, we, uh, not October for John and I, but you know what? If you're in Canada, you'll feel our warm (laughs) welcome. Hopefully we'll see you soon there, Nikki. Stay in touch and we will talk soon, I'm sure. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you. We want to thank Dr. Nikki Newton again for spending some time with us and the Math Moment Maker community so she can share her insights with all math educators around the globe. As always, how will you reflect on the learning you've heard here in this episode? Have you written ideas down? Have you drawn a sketch note? Have you sent out any tweets? Call the colleague. Be sure to engage in some form of reflection to ensure that the learning you've done here sticks. And in order to ensure you don't miss out on new episodes as they come out each week, be sure to take that phone out of your pocket and smash the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts. Google Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcasting platform might be. And if you have some time, definitely leave us a rating and review because that ensures that people around the globe have a better chance of bumping into this particular podcast. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 62. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 62. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high fives for you.